some guys online. Thank you all for being here. Do pray for the church. There's a lot of people that have mentioned um, over this past week came down with the, the, I guess it's the Omicron variant of COVID, but 20 some people want to understand. Zach, can you fill that out? And just put Joy down, you, me, and Janice. Oh, JPM. All right, well, we're going to get started in <laughs> chapter nine, uh, just to kind of recap for those watching online. And uh, we have been here, feels like, in a long time. <laughs> uh, we had, were out last week for homecoming. Uh, but chapter eight, uh, we saw uh, just some persecution going on in the church. We we learned of a guy named Simon, uh, the sorcerer is kind of the way we labeled him, and he he got the wrong idea about God, the wrong idea about what being a, a disciple and an apostle was. He tried to pay his way into that crowd, and they sent him away basically. And uh, Philip ended up witnessing to the Ethiopian eunuch, and the work was going along really good. And there was a guy named Saul who had killed um, Stephen. He was one of the disciples and was the first public murder of one of Jesus' followers. And we see in chapter 9, however, this same man Saul, who was after the disciples uh, determined to kill them, he got saved. <laughs> he went through this transformation that only God can do and chapter 9 starts off uh, telling us that Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples and he's working with the religious Jews and it says that he went to the high priest and he got letters uh, as authorization to go and just round all these believers up all that he could men and women it says and bring them bound unto Jerusalem but along the journey, um, we looked at this in the last lesson, but along the journey he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He heard a voice. He was blinded. Uh, we see that he was three days without sight. And he was led uh, to a place where he was simply just going to reflect, basically for three days. And God spoke to a man named Ananias. And Ananias was hesitant, as I would be, because, you know, all the Christians had heard of this guy, Saul. They had heard of him. They knew he was out to kill everybody. And he was very hesitant. Uh, but he, God kind of talked to him through that. And he says in verse 13, he says, I've heard of this guy, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he says, I even hear you now he's got the authority to come bind all that call on your name. I'd be afraid to go. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd be seriously mean, questioning what? these instructions. Uh, but the Lord said to him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I, I kind of see that as a statement of comfort to Ananias that, you know, I'm going to show him what humility is all about. And not in a bad way, but I'm going to humble him and he's not going to be a threat uh, to you or to the believers anymore. I, I believe was that was the message that God was giving to him through verse 16. And then we see what happened in, in verse 17. Uh, Ananias came, he calls him Brother Saul, says the Lord, um, even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way um, as thou camest, has sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes at his, as it had been scales, and he received sight and arose and was baptized. So he was converted, he believed, he received the Holy Spirit was baptized and he got on fire for Jesus. He was extremely excited and ready to go out and basically uh, just set the world on fire for Christ. 
and we see in verse 19 here's what we're kind of revisiting this today um, because we got we got off off in the ditch a little bit last time with what this means so I want to tie some of this together as to what happened from the time Saul got saved to the time he went back to his hometown of Tarsus so we see here uh, two places verse 19 and verse 23 that has given a little bit of question are you eating your earbud case no. Go ahead. <laughs> and it says when he had received meat he was strengthened and then Saul then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus so that phrase certain days kind of opens up just a window of opportunity for interpretation. I'm, mine's got several days. Several days. Okay, mine says certain days. And then in verse 23, we'll, we'll skip a little bit and get to there, it says, after that, many days were fulfilled. What did you say? Verse after 23. many days had gone by. Okay. So after the many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So we see in verse 19, he it says, um, after, where are we at? I don't lost my place. Yeah, certain day, in verse 19, Saul was uh, certain days with the disciples at Damascus. Now these were not the apostles. So the apostles, where were they at? In Jerusalem. They were still in Jerusalem. So Peter and, and James and all of them were in Jerusalem still. So these were followers of Christ, but not the 12 apostles. These were just disciples that were living in Damascus because word had already gotten out. I mean, he's going all over the place, surrounding these Christians up to put them in prison. So there so were... anyone at that time, anyone who was a believer... And a follower was, was a, a disciple. Follower was called a disciple. Correct. And that's and why then, we distinguish the difference in a disciple and an apostle. Okay, so his 12 were... The apostles. apostles. Okay. We call them both disciples and apostles. Right. But through this book, it seems to be more emphasized of the difference of the 12 were called the apostles and anybody else that's following Jesus at that point, which at this point is maybe uh, close to 10,000 because we saw 3,000 saved in one day at the day of Pentecost and somewhere around there. And this kind of went on for a while. So we could be upwards of 20, 50, or, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 people following and they're spreading like wildfire because of Saul. Saul sent them scattering. You know, last week the church was pretty full. Yes, very I mean, full. I, I, even though I couldn't be here, I watched it. And y'all did a great job. Thank you. And but I almost cried at the end because no one walked forward. Right. And that was a good sermon. It was. Uh, he's not a ventriloquist, <laughs> but he's a good yeah, preacher. Absolutely. But anyway, I was I was sitting there thinking that church is full. Mm -hmm. so, there's got to be someone or some people in there who are not believers. Right. And for at least not where they need to be as a believer. Right, right. <laughs> and no one. And nobody came forward. Came yeah. forward, and and it just, I, 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 I just. Yeah, I reflect cried. on that quite a bit. I and do. So, I just kind of broke my heart. Right. Um, so there were a lot here, and and they they were not only moving, coming forward, but they were moving forward in the faith and and going all over, teaching people about Jesus, and and Saul joined them. Uh, we see there in verse 19. So something happened. It's kind of where I'm going with this. Between verse 19 and verse 23. He's joined the disciples at Damascus. He's not yet met with the apostles in Jerusalem, which we see in verse 26 and moving down. But in verse 23, we say, After many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So the reason I'm kind of going back through this is last week it was brought up about Saul's three years. 
So we learn in Galatians chapter 1, uh, yeah, chapter 1, verses 15 down to 24. If we want to flip over there, I'll reference that. We read kind of a little different account of this event. It's not really, it's just it gives us different details. And a lot of people are confused about it. I was uncertain about it, to be honest, because, you know, we have a way of processing things and understanding things, but I always have to remember the Bible tells me not to lean to mine own understanding, <laughs> but we need to consult the Holy Spirit and read and pray and really seek out the answers from God, which is what I've really tried to do over the last couple of weeks uh, since we had our last session. And it says, uh, Paul's, Paul, of course, is writing to the church of Galatia, and this is his letter to the church. In verse 17, uh, it starts prior to that, but he clarifies in verse 17, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus, then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So he, he was a Christian three years before, before he, he joined before forces he with the joined. apostles. Okay, I did not. Yes. That did not. Uh, yes. And that was the question that came up is that phrase in verse 23 of Acts 9 that after many days does that mean the three years? And my initial response to that was I have a hard time believing that, uh, but at the same time, I'm leaving myself open for God to lead me in that because I was kind of like, well, why are they trying to kill him? You know, what's going on? He's just been converted. Has word of that gotten around? that they know he's converted. And then I thought, well, if he, because a lot, a lot of people interpret this, is Paul spent three years in solitary. Saul, I guess I should say. Spent three years in solitary out in the desert somewhere, just figuring everything out and getting prepared to go and begin to preach. That's the, that's the way I've always heard it growing up, is that he was three years in the desert, just kind of praying and studying and, getting reacclimated to who Jesus was, and that's probably part of it. But you get the imagery of he just disappeared for three years. And then he shows back up, joins forces with the disciples, or the apostles, and begins to move forward. That's the way I've always heard it and been taught. But the question that kind of spurred my deeper study the last couple of weeks of this is, well, if he just disappeared for three years, I would have thought that any news of him ceasing to continue the work of trying to capture the Christians would have just blown over. In three years you hadn't heard from this guy, and you're still so mad at him that you're wanting to kill him? I, I think... Yeah, there's a lot of questions that swirled around in my mind about this. What it, do you think? It makes this? more sense to me that after he was saved, received the Holy Spirit, and was baptized, he met with the b disciples or believers there where he in Damascus. Right. And 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 there, there were the Pharisees in Damascus, right. and they would try to kill him because number one, he was working for them. And then, exactly. boing, he's working against them. Right, right. And I, to me, it makes sense to me that that after the disciples in Damascus saved him, got him out of there, then God said, you need to go and get away from all of these people and for that's a still, time. And, right. you know... So that, that's still a couple of pieces that I'm trying to put together in my head. But this is, this is what I've come up with so far. And I'm not going to say I'm right or that I'm wrong. This is just where I'm at at this point. 
putting these two passages together in Galatians 1 and Acts 9, we do know, number one, that he got saved. That's, that's pretty clear, obviously. So he is saved, he's a new person, and we do know at some point, according to Galatians 1, it was three years after his conversion that he went to Jerusalem and he met with Peter. Now, we also see other pieces of this back in Acts 9 where it says, when he had verse 19, when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then, Saul, uh, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway, this is what we find out what he was doing. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. So the synagogues were what? What are synagogues? Jewish. Yeah, synagogues even still today are Jewish churches. So he was preaching Jesus in the Jewish synagogues, the Jewish churches, which is what got the Jews all flared up to begin with. No wonder they got mad at exactly. him. I mean, one day he's working, killing people, helping them to kill Christians. And now he's preaching now the he's message. he's preaching the <laughs> message of Christ. Right, it says that he preached Christ that he is the Son of God. Which was the whole reason they sent him to the cross to begin with, is they said that's blasphemy. He must die, and then their spokesperson going out rounding up everybody who's believing this stuff. He's now preaching the same exact message that they were believing that he was killing them for, and now he's one of the followers of it, and that's and now he's preaching it in the Jewish churches. And I think that's why God could use him for the Gentiles. Right. Because he, there's no way the Jews would accept him. Well, they wouldn't accept any of the apostles, right. but especially him. And in and, and, and those three years that he was gone, because he was still Saul here, and those three years that he was gone helped him to learn and to become Paul. Paul, exactly. Does that make sense? It does make sense. This is, that's exactly what happened, that, to what I believe. And to your point, he did say, God, Jesus said uh, to Ananias in verse 15 of Acts 9, he says, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So he's called to preach to all of them. Yeah, but he, also, he didn't preach as much to the Jews as he did the Gentiles. Yeah, he evidently did for three years, and that's why they're trying yeah, to get him. <laughs> so this is what well, part part of what I'm learning through here. And then also, Paul, or yeah, Paul even says in Galatians 1:15, "But it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, who called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen." And immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now, so we're kind of getting a little picture of before he went to see the apostles, he spent three years doing something. Part of what he was doing, obviously, was preaching Christ to the Jews, even. And that's why they're seeking out to kill him. And verse 21 says, But all that heard him were amazed, and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent? He's basically, Is this not the guy that was going to kill all these people preaching the same message, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And then it says, And after many days that were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Hence this picture I have behind me on the slide. This is a picture of Paul being lowered down out of the city. Now, 
in my immature mind of this, for some reason I got the picture of, well, Paul was stuck in the city of Damascus for three years and he couldn't get out. And then after the end of the three years, they lowered him down in a basket. I don't know that that's the case, because why would he say over here that he was in Arabia and Damascus? I think it was he was back and forth. And once word surfaced that he was back in Damascus after, uh, towards the end of the three years, that they all made this plan, the Jews made this plan to go after him and find him and kill him, and he was snuck down out of a window to leave. We also get another, uh, where is it at? There's another reference. I've got too many notes here. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11 says, In Damascus, the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Demesians with a garrison desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. So he even tells this account again to the church of Corinth later on. Um, so the king found out he was there, and they snuck him out by letting him down in the basket. So how do we make sense of all this? There are several things, too, that I think are to take into consideration of what was going on. So if we look at um, Arab the phrase Arabia, that's, number one, the only passage in the entire Bible that that's brought up. He doesn't mention it in any other letters. But what was in Arabia? Do I have any idea? Where he says that he was in Arabia and then went back to Damascus. What's the significance of Arabia? What's the significance of Arabia? Of Arabia, John. <laughs> in the story. So, and I don't know for sure, this is just my thought, but if you look at it on a map, okay, you've got Jerusalem. Damascus is north of Jerusalem. Okay. Geographically, Arabia or the Ar Saudi Arabia today, and what's called the Arabian Peninsula, is east and south. It's a big body of land. Basically, that is where Moses spent his 40 years running from what he did in Egypt. So, what did Moses do in Egypt that he had to run from? Oh, he, he, killed, he killed one of the Egyptian soldiers for smiting and beating the Hebrew slaves. Well, he ran and went to the land of Midian, where he ended up marrying, finding a wife, and married his wife, and had some kids. And, and uh, that's also where he took the children of Israel back to that same area after they left Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea, and instead of going straight on and hooking over and going on into Jerusalem, they ended up spending 40 years wandering around in circles because they doubted that God had given them the land. God did that. And, and God had caused that. <laughs> and they wandered all around and even as low as the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, which is where Mount Sinai is. That's where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. So this whole geographical region is what we call the Arabian Peninsula. So the way... I'm leaning towards, and I've been praying and studying and asking God to show this to me, and I haven't found a whole lot of study notes about this that say this, uh, but I haven't seen anything that contradicts it either. I think Paul, Saul at the time, he went to Damascus, started preaching, they started trying to run after him because he was preaching in synagogues, and he escaped and retreated to the Arabian Peninsula at times and then went back, and maybe preached some more, and then went back to the Arabian Peninsula, and was back and forth and back and forth until he just felt like he was ready. But doing that, he was a very, very learned man. Oh, absolutely. He had to have been studying a lot. And he was raised Jewish. Correct. And so he had the whole background. Absolutely. And I think that, and I kind of think that's why it, it, it makes sense that he would go to the Arabian Peninsula, maybe to relive the experiences of the Israelites as they were wandering in the wilderness.
was. And as they went, I don't know if he went all the way down to Mount Sinai or not, but maybe he did. And maybe that's why it took him three years, because he but, traveled. But during that time, he was learning more about Jesus. Exactly, that was the point, is to learn about Jesus. And then coming back and honing his skills. And exactly. then going, and then run out and home, you know, right. and learn some more. And there is one other piece that I find interesting, and I'm still kind of piecing some of this together, but it's it's making pretty good sense to me anyway in my brain. Um, in Second Timothy chapter four, he's ending his letters to Timothy, and he says in verse nine, "Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me." He's like, you know, he's he's in prison. He's writing these letters. He's like, "I need you to come to me," and he wants him to bring some things. It says in verse 13, the cloak that I left at Troas with Capris, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. And that's all he says. He doesn't say why. He doesn't say what's on them. It's kind of like that little phrase at the end of National Treasure, you know, where he says, uh, it's just life changing, sir. You know, it's all the president. It's like you, you're given some little pieces of information. And you're like, what's what's the deal with the cloak? What's the books? What was it was on the parchments? I think it has something to do with maybe his writings, or at least what he was studying, possibly during those three years. Maybe it's things he was developing. Maybe things that he was uh, being given by the Holy Spirit. Because we do see in Galatians, he said that he did not confer with flesh and blood. He did not talk to the apostles. He did not even confer with himself. He was leaning on the Holy Spirit to teach him the things that he needed to know. And of course he was with some of the disciples, learning, doing things. What are some other things that he learned? You brought up that he was a devout Hebrew. And one of the things that I've noticed is that he was being changed in mindset from being the Hebrew of Hebrews, as he called himself, to the chief of sinners, as he called himself in the letter to Timothy. Um, he says in verse uh, 4 of Philippians 3, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. It's like if anybody out there could say, I am worthy, that's me and more because I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's how he described himself. But, he concludes, what things were gained to me with that mindset, I counted loss for Christ. He had to come to a place in his mind where he got over himself. And he became humble to the point that he realized, even though I'm the pedigree of pedigrees, that means nothing when it comes to God. I've got to focus on just God and put Him first and learn who this Jesus is. Instead of chasing after people for believing him, I need to join forces with them so we can spread the gospel. So he went from being the Hebrew of Hebrews to 1 Timothy 1.15. He calls himself the chief of sinners. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So he was shifting a mindset of being entitled to just being thankful that God was willing to use him anyway. So that was one thing that he was learning. He is also learning about what we call a thorn in the flesh. We know somewhere along the way, and most people, and I agree, believe that this thorn was pride because of what he said about himself and also uh, what he says in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, of such a one will I glory Yet of myself will I not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, 
For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest that any man should think me above that which he seemeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. He's like, I mean, this guy wrote 13 of the New Testament books. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Somebody, some people label him as the author of Hebrews, some people don't. But he wrote the majority of the New Testament. And that's kind of what he's saying. He said, unless I should be exalted through the abundance of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. But he's basically saying to keep me from having a big head, to keep me from being uh, thinking that I am more than I am, God gave me this thorn in the flesh. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly thereof will I glorify in my infirmities, or my weaknesses, basically is what he's saying, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, so what I'm was he... You said, I'm glad you brought that up, because <laughs> I was sitting here thinking, I wonder... If the thorn in his side was the knowledge right. of all he had done against Christ and Christians. It could be that too. That you know, he I, was felt guilt over it. That I, could be I have of it. I have things in my life that e even though I know I'm forgiven. Right. And I know that I as I know, I know, I know. But sometimes it comes up in my mind. Absolutely. If I had just I think of gone people the that, other way. I, I think of people that I, I felt I should have done a better job of witnessing to that ended up dying without Christ. And I, I sometimes wear that. And I'm like, you know, I've kind of, you know, my Uncle Bob uh, comes to mind. He was openly an atheist. And we witnessed to him, shared the gospel with him, but I always keep going back and forth. Could I have done a better job? Could I have pushed that a little more? And I have to come to the conclusion of it's everybody's choice. They may make their own choices. Exactly. But we still beat ourselves up over could I have done better? Could I have done Could different? I? Should and, I? Sure. You know, yeah. yeah. And that makes more sense to me than him having some physical right ailment he i think it was more he, psychological and emotional than anything because he was a very emotional man and very into his psyche you know right. just very very a very sure. intense person well i mean if you if you try to get in his mind and you go from he thought he was doing god a favor by killing all these people who are following this blasphemer and that's what he was all about, and that's what he pointed out in Philippians 3, that he was the model example. But I count all that as loss for Christ, because it was all against Christ. So I'm sure he was dealing with that. And then also, as you're saying, he's the guy that almost shut the thing down. Of course, you know, it was pointed out earlier that if God is in this, you'll not be able to stop it, right. which is exactly what happened. It wasn't able to be stopped. So I'm sure Paul beat himself over up over that too. He was like, I, I put so much effort into myself and into my Hebrewness of who I was that I was killing people for following Jesus. And then at the same time, he's like, ooh, wow, I was killing the very people who Jesus chose personally to send this message out. I, there's tons of stuff I'm sure he was struggling with and he was fighting with. So when I put all that together, I'm like, well, no, long, no wonder it took him three years. <laughs> mm -hmm. to sort through all these things. But then he evidently came to a place uh, where he felt he was ready to move forward. And I believe that's when he ended up back in Damascus. And it says that the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Then we see uh, verse 26 back in Acts 9. We'll kind of try to finish this chapter out. Um, it says, And then when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. 
But Barnabas, here Barnabas shows back up in the story. He was a guy back in Acts 2 that sold everything he had and gave it to the disciples to be distributed among the believers because he was all in. He came and vouched for him. And he declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Now the details of that is given to us in Galatians 1 where he said after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Now Paul points out but other of the apostles I saw none save James the Lord's brother. So evidently they were still there was a two week period of time where he was in Jerusalem I think most of the even apostles were like, I don't know about this guy. <laughs> and they stayed away from him. Do you think that's why it took three years before he met with the apostles? It could have been. God. It was God's timeline and he was waiting on at least a point where at least one or two of them, which is what ended up happening, would talk to him. And I'm glad they did because, again, he's known as one of the greatest Christians that we've ever known in the history of the world. Uh, but we do know he met for 15 days with Paul and James. And a lot of people kind of dispute that because it says that he met with the apostles. And a lot of people don't consider James, the brother of Jesus, to be an apostle. But we had that discussion earlier in Acts 1, I think it was, where it is possible that James and Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but another one, were the half-brothers of Jesus. Because we get a list of names, Joseph, Judah, James, and there's another one, Simon. Um, so it's very possible that those two of the twelve were indeed Jesus' half-brothers, which would make James, the brother of Jesus, an actual apostle, one of the twelve that Jesus originally chose. So that all ties together perfectly through the research that I've done. And it says that he was with them coming in and out of Jerusalem. And then we see a transition point. Verse 29 says, And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. It's like everywhere he went and everywhere he preached, somebody wanted to kill him for what he was doing. It says, Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So that's when they sent him back home to Tarsus to, I guess, reunite with his family, let them know what all had happened to him. Um, and we see him surface again later, obviously, because he wrote the majority of the New Testament. But we see him later in the book of Acts. But he kind of goes away at this point and just goes back home. It says, And then the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit was multiplied. So that's the story of Paul and kind of where he was at. I hope that kind of makes sense and clears up a little bit of those three years. I do think now that I've studied and reflected that verse 23 that says after that many days were fulfilled is indeed those three years <coughs> that he was back and forth in Arabia and Damascus and learning all these things about Jesus and learning about his thorn in the flesh and uh, how to shift from Hebrew Hebrews to the chief of sinners and get his mind right and his emotions correct. And then he goes back home to Tarsus and everything just settled down, it says, uh, throughout all the land of Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And they were all edified. And then, to finish out the chapter, it says, And it came to pass, as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept uh, his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Jesus Christ makes thee whole, arise, make thy bed. And he arose me immediately, and all that dwelled at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. So here he goes, Peter. while Peter's around in this area, he's just going around and, and helping people. And then we see verse 36, you know, down it says, Now there was at Joppa certain, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is by interpretation called Dorcas. We all grin at that. This is a funny name. 
says, And this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they had laid her in an upper chamber, basically getting ready to bury her. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there, and they sent unto him two men desiring that he would not delay to come to them. So he's in the area. They want him to come and help in some way. Then Peter arose and went with them. And when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. And just talking about how much of a beautiful person she was and all the great things that she had done. But Peter, he didn't want to hear it <laughs> for whatever reason, says he put them all forth. He's like, get out of here. Go away. And he sends them all out of the room. And he kneeled down and prayed. And turning him to the body, he said, Tabitha. I, I can see her laid on the table. He's praying and he just leans in and says, Tabitha, arise. I mean, what a moment to sit there and, and to, to have this happen. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. I mean, wow. you don't think of that. This person's dead, and everybody's at her funeral, and he sends them all out, and all of a sudden she sits up after he says arise, and he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and the widows, presented her alive. I can imagine like us going to the funeral home, and somebody running us all out of the room, and then all of a sudden they walk out with them living. I mean, that's kind of what was going on here. It says, and it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, and it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. So, well, that's how we close out chapter 9. We'll talk a little bit about Simon the tanner next week, and then we'll get into chapter 10. Y'all got any questions or anything? Right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to our online folks. Join us next week as we look at chapter 10.